From the heart.org, Medscape Cardiology, this is the Bob Harrington Show. Dr. Robert Harrington is the Stephen and Suzanne Weiss Dean of Weill Cornell Medicine and Provost for Medical Affairs of Cornell University. This podcast is intended for healthcare professionals only. Any views expressed are the presenter's own and do not necessarily reflect the views of WebMD or Medscape. Hi, this is Bob Harrington from Weill Cornell Medicine. That's my first show, uh, right. Weill Cornell Medicine. <laughs> So um, I'm here with uh, my good friend Manesh Patel from Duke University. We're at the ESC in Amsterdam. And I pulled Manesh into the studio for a conversation about something that's really topical right now, and that is sudden cardiac death in athletes. And what I hope to do over the course of the next 15 minutes or so is really pick Manesh's brain on how are we thinking about this? Are we going to think about treatment issues? Are we going to think about prevention issues? Are we going to think about screening? Um, and really try to make it practical. So as I said, my, my guest is Dr. Manesh Patel from Duke University, where he's the chief of cardiovascular medicine and also the director of the Duke Heart Center. Manesh, thanks for joining me here. Excited to be here, Bob, always. You know, you and I talked about this topic a few weeks ago, and then just yesterday, a news article comes out that's, that reveals the cause of uh, Ronnie, Ronnie James' as, uh, sudden cardiac death. But let, let me put it into the bigger societal context. Yeah. Yeah. Last winter, we had uh, DeMar Hamlin from the Buffalo Bills who uh, suffered a traumatic injury on the field and with that had cardiac arrest. He's back playing football. Great to see. You and I are involved with the Heart Association. He's been very supportive of our efforts around things like CPR. Yeah. Um, he's been terrific. Yeah. Great to see him playing. Friday James, we know a little less about. Yeah. And last night, all the news article says is the cause is both functional and anatomical, and it seems to be congenital, but we don't have any details beyond that. So let's not focus on the people. Yeah. Let's focus on the top. Well, I'm excited that we're having the conversation. And first and foremost, we're excited that what we've seen on a national stage, that these two individuals are doing well, they survived a sudden cardiac death, which again, I think is a testament to all the things that we'll talk about first, but many more important questions that are existing in the world right now, like is this increasing? Is this something we can prevent? And what are those things that might be happening to athletes? Can we predict it? Can we predict it? Right. So I think the idea of sudden cardiac death in athletes is really a critical one for us to think about because it does talk about participation in what we think about. And there are many experts and actual people who've been studying this for years that I, I get to now participate. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about the kind of things you've been doing in this area. Even before these events in the COVID area, we were wondering both about the questions about athletes getting to play myocarditis, but just in general, what do we know about them? And people like Aaron Baggish, Kim Harmon, John Dresden, or others have been studying this for quite some time. Yeah, you and I did a show on athletes and COVID. We actually, with the American Heart Association, the Cornette Foundation, others, we started something called the, the Outcomes Registry for Collegiate Athletes with Cardiac Condition, ORCA. And so this, this registry actually is across the United States where athletes can sign up. And Voluntary or do this, their school sign up? or does they School and the athletes sign up. Okay. So team trainers, the doctors talk to the athletes, say, hey, we... We don't really know on some of these conditions. There's a lot of gray area, right? It's a, not quite hooking, but a thick ventricle. Um, people with certain conditions that were really what, interesting about aortas that are dilated in tall people. Long QT. Long QT. There's certainly things that we know we should be doing certain things for. Other ones where participation's a question. So all of these we're trying to longitudinally put into registry and follow them over time. The second thing is understanding from the last Bethesda conference that we want shared decision making. There are going to be conditions where you go, look, I think your risk is so high that, you know, you've had a family history of sudden cardiac death. Yeah. You you have uh, arrhythmia as well. We're exercising you and you have hope. Of, and you have a big, thick heart. Yeah. When you, if you have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, whether you're an athlete or a 40-year-old adult, we're going to have the same co conversation. And I think that holds. But there's a variety of spectrum that we don't know. And so I think the registry is one big step. Getting back to like when somebody has an event. I would say take the teachable moment with the AHA and others to make sure your communities, your areas have AEDs, have fast CPR training, and that we get to 100%, 100% response, 100% CPR, 100% defibrillation. Because I think that's the first. Let's really focus on this, the uh, the chain of survival. Yeah. Because it is a chain. Yeah. And if any link is broken, your risk of survival really drops. Yeah. And we've had some uh, well-known cases within our AHA community, including somebody who talks about it regularly, Kevin Volk from yeah. the University of Pennsylvania, a health economist, um, he had almost the perfect chain of survival. Had sudden cardiac death in a restaurant, immediately observed, CPR started, EMTs called, AED on the scene. I mean, impressive. 
Yeah, no, in, in Cincinnati, where it's, uh, interestingly, you know, communities that have really worked on these yeah. things. And so I, I think you're right, the chain of survival and rapid CPR and, and, and building a nation of survivors, which is, a, you know, the, the, the people at the AJ are helping us do this, but the, this national call to make sure CPR is something that people feel comfortable doing. Yeah. They do it in men and women. They do it across anyone that goes down and realize that it's, it's CPR's hands only. Hands only. And, that's, and I think that's an important session that from DeMar's work, uh, Nancy Brown and our HA session going. And I think actually for kids, schools, many countries require that to get through primary requirement to graduate from high school in some states. That's right. That you have to have CPR training. So yeah, my son just graduated from high school and we, we just spent time at our at his high school making sure everybody had access. And, and, and so I think the way to do this is to start with that. And then for athletes, now getting more specific about teams and athletes, I think many and most have emergency action plans, but having action plans where, because of where you are and where the locations might be, what the sport is, having a plan on how you're going to get that athlete to a place where you can help them recover is an important piece. From there, I think the conversation for us really is a lot about what can we do as a society and as a country to answer some critical questions and some that are existing. I think in real world questions that people are asking, I'm saying, well, we had COVID and we're hearing these cases. Is this going up? Right. It's going down. Are these related? And um, soon, hopefully in publication, we'll see that the same group I talked about and others actually working with the NCAA has looked at all the deaths that they've observed in the NC2A Division One athletes over 20 years, including the sudden cardiac deaths. I won't share the results because the publication's not out, but I think that's the kind of important information that'll help us understand, are these rates going up or down? What's associated with that risk? Yeah. Because then we can start getting at, is it something that when we're doing um, assessment for suitability for sports, are there risk factors that should warrant more investigation? Yeah. So much like the field of cardiology, we haven't had enough evidence base or the right technologies or let's say the studies to say, here's how we should do screening or not screening yeah. across a broad. Again, variation. Some countries where anyone participating is going to get an EKG and an echo. Other countries where, like ours in the United States, where it's going to be a bit dependent on patient risk or athlete risk. And where you live. And where you live. And unfortunately, again, brings in the idea that it might not be equitable in how right. we're evaluating these individuals. So I do think the opportunity to start to standardize that, that evaluation exists. And it likely comes from the ability to look back and say, here's some high risk individuals, mm -hmm. here's some high risk scenarios. Is this what we do all the time in clinical medicine? Yeah, it's <laughs> just going to be applied to a, a new uh, or a population that we maybe not have studied. Now, I said this to you before we came on. I mean, the other thing is to make sure that the shared decision making allows athletes who feel like they have a chance or want to play. You know, when we had COVID and had a, a lot of college athletes, high school athletes, kids not able to participate in sports, there were significant depression, yeah. not feeling of wellness, not even physical loss, you know, people actually getting less conditioned quickly. And so there's a great benefit. And we were extrapolating from a lot of other data yeah. as to, you know, why can't, if I've just had this infection and I've got yeah. maybe some signs of it in my heart, why can't I exercise? Yeah. Well, that's extrapolating from old myocarditis data. Yeah. Yeah. So we're having to learn and follow. And yeah. I think some of the value of following that, getting those data out are important. The second thing I think is really valuable is that we've shown that these individuals, if you do have these conversations and follow them, can participate and can be part of understanding the risk, just like anything else. Is it sports specific? Are there some sports that maybe the conversation should be a little more intense than other sports? It's interesting. You know, I think what we'll see is that the, the conversations probably, it, some of it may be sports specific, some of it may be also the number of athletes. You know, testing and doing these things at yeah. times is pretty complicated. But it does look like there's, as you know, different sorts of weight bearing uh, performance athletes, uh, endurance athletes, or what I'll call burst, right? And so yeah. it does look like probably there's um, going to be data that we think are going to be important for us to think about certain sports where we pay a little bit. And, and, and what about the contact issues? You know, Damar had a very specific thing, we think, happen yeah. to him. Yeah. Um, football is a, a violent contact-oriented sport, but fortunately, we don't see what happens to Damar regularly. We're talking about sudden cardiac death, but obviously contact issues and the whole neurologic evaluation. Of That's it. another issue. Talk yeah. about another big yeah. issue yeah. that I know many are, are following. And then NC2A is too, carefully. Well, for Damara, I mean, I think we know that it was primordial cortis, and at least when that happens, you know, when there's a ball or a trauma to the chest, I think those things have to be timed just so to actually lead yeah. to this event. And so thankfully it's not very frequent, but it can happen. And, and it requires and particularly that. if you think about, you know, hockey pucks, yeah. baseballs, yeah. 
um, soccer balls, yeah. all these things, you know, helmet to the chest. Yeah, you have to be in that cycle of yep. the squeeze. We don't see it very frequently. I do think the the, the evaluation and treatment really makes a difference. One thing I think we're evolving and in getting into the screening world is our imaging is getting better. We are not just doing echoes. We are able to do other studies. I think there's a mixture between not our imaging, but also other technologies. Well, let's talk about that because screening is the area, I would say, where there's the most controversy. Yeah. And a lot of emotional controversy. You know, hey, the data's not good enough to screen me. Um, or doc saying, wait a minute, what are we screening all these kids? And if you think about, you know, you said your son, you were at your son's high school doing CPR training. I mean, how many athletes at his high school? There's a lot. And that's a pretty small high school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, big communities, big universities, the professional sports can afford it. Yeah. But yeah. should we be doing this at the community level? Well, there have been some data, as, as people have done. You know, the, the Italian group yep. in Italy has done standard screening for some time. And it's shown us that if you did echoes in a lot of individuals, you do find some cases with that are hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or pathology. The issue is just how much you have to do in that resource utilization. And I think as we get to a world where screening studies can happen with smaller technology, AI, things that can be democratizing how we get to athletes. Give but, an example of that. We were talking outside, you and I, about yeah. some of the new stethoscope technology. I think, yes, yeah, stethoscopes are going to be one of the examples where now that we have stethoscopes that both have the ability to get sounds and electrocardiographic signals, or at least some lead signals, yep. potentially you can imagine that sound and ECG tracing in an AI environment, at least getting you from everyone gets a listen with one stethoscope in their gym from their coach. It goes to the cloud. So when there's enough questions about that, now these are the ones that have to go yeah. into that. Now that's a big study it has to be carried out. I'm not by any way saying they should do that. But the technology is coming. Right. We start to see that the world of, of our ability to rapidly do something with something at meeting our athletes or our patients where they are will happen yeah. faster. And remembering that the performance curve can vary, but once you have a sound that you can start to say, hey, this is regular flow murmur versus I'm worried about this, then the especially as you met market with ECG. So that's one example of um, smaller imaging. That's another example. Many years EKGs have been talked about. There's entire courses and others that we run looking at EKGs today. Yep. And remembering that uh, Aaron and others have published, you know, that these individuals are large. So when we look at their hearts and we see they're large, but when you adjust for size, that often you can identify that many of them are within what we think are normal. But structurally, there's still many cases where you look at uh, hearts and you're saying, is this a, a thick heart, is this non-compaction, is this some right. pathologic? And that's where I think imaging expertise, that's where I think you have to have those individuals. I'm not advocating screening, I'm advocating studying that we should be thinking about the population. They don't see a world where we don't eventually start to really look to prevent those. Right, whether it's understanding that there are certain risk factors associated with this and we have to dedicate screening resources to those individuals, or if we wanna do more broadly on the population level, to understand this with deeper dives into certain individuals, um, we've got to study. The, some of the, the the experts in sports medicine, sports cardiology have been collecting some of these data for a while. It's actually a time where they're, because of these events, going to have the opportunity to share more of this data and maybe raise awareness, not in the teachable moment only, to get others to contribute. Because I do believe long-term there's an opportunity. And we've seen that, right? We see that the rates, unfortunately, even for marathon runners, where people unfortunately have events that seem yep. to be higher, and we've seen the studies where we see troponin leaks in these individuals or evidence that there's some effect in the heart on these events. We want people to be able to be long-term healthy. And so that's obviously a thing. That so a lot of work needs to be done. We talked about it with regard to screening. We've talked about CPR. We really need to have a nation of people that can do hands-only CPR. Yeah. Let's talk about AEDs, another key part of the uh, this chain of survival. We have, a, we have another um, important study going on, but an important message. First is AEDs are critical to survival. We know not only is a CPR critical, it's getting people- Early defibrillation. Early defibrillation. Yeah. Early CPR is one of the biggest markers of making sure we perfuse people to get to early defibrillation, but then you have to get yeah. early defibrillation. And so there's been a huge push in many communities, again, along with AHA and others, are working hard to make sure ADs are available in the in the US, but around the world, we're at ESC and we see the push around the world to get ADs available. And they've come down in size, they've come down in cost. cost, and that's made it much more accessible. That's really good. But they're still not always there, right? And we've seen really interesting randomized studies where we've seen people in some of the European countries saying, well, we'll have certain areas just because of the locations where bystanders will help get an AED there yeah. versus randomizing to the, the EMS truck, and they, they seem better in some of those variations. Chris Granger at our institution with Monique Starks and others is doing a, 
and Dan Mark is doing a study in North Carolina where we're testing different ways to potentially get AEDs in communities. And we're randomizing counties to one or two ways of maybe getting AEDs to those individuals. Can you have an app where you just, you know, find me an AED? Is there a world of where that AEDs found or there are things bringing you the AED? Are there drones? Are there people driving? Are there ways that an AED is brought to the scene? So all of those are going to be critical. It starts with continuing to figure out ways to support the cost of getting AEDs in places. And the technology is continuing. Because it really is the pre-medical system stuff that makes the difference. I mean, once EMS arrives with trained individuals who can defibrillate, who can transport you to a medical facility where trained you know, physicians are, 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 are at, but it's that pre-EMS thing that's so critical. And we talk a lot about athletes, but, but cardiac arrest care in general and the chain yeah. of survival with CPR and AED, we, I still see some of our patients in the CICU at Duke and others, and we see, unfortunately, that the biggest driver, as you just highlighted in that chain of survival, is how rapid we were in that golden hour, first 15 minutes, yeah. are you getting CPR, are you getting AED, are you getting to assist? Are you getting a rapid transport? Are you getting a rapid transport? Yeah. Are you getting a neurologic assessment? Are you getting pulled or not? Those are important things. All right, let's try to wrap this up. Teachable moments we talked about, and one of the things about uh, prominent athletes, it makes it to the newspaper. Uh, and it then raises the awareness for the rest of us. So there is a drawing inference from a small group of cases to the broader societal issue. So that's an important topic. We've talked about possible screening options, identifying at-risk individuals, high-risk individuals, a lot of work. A lot of data has already been accumulated, but more work to be done. And we focused a lot on how do we use those teachable moments to really influence the chain of survival, not just for athletes, but for um, for society at large. And I love your point about the Bethesda conference on shared decision-making because like everything else we do, you have to have that two-way conversation. What, what, what is the athlete's goals and hopes and aspirations? Yeah. And that, and that, that group of experts in, in addition to shared decision-making gave us a whole list of conditions we'd be aware of and sort of the cut points of where we think normal and not normal lives for athletes. So I think that's used by many. The second, the last piece I'll just say is, and this is, I think in line with you is, can we build our systems to make research happen faster for these yeah. individuals? These athletes are at colleges that are obviously doing a lot to make sure they're okay. And the team of people that are helping with this registry and others are going to continue to work to say, can we engage them as citizen participants and scientists with us yeah. to say what matters? Because I think athletes are going to become some of our best advocates for why you want to know about yourself to perform this best. Oh, the concept of the citizen scientist, yeah. that we all have an obligation to contribute to the evidence base because we all want to use that evidence. Yeah, absolutely. So this has been a terrific conversation. I've been joined by my good friend, Dr. Manesh Patel from Duke University. Um, I hope you've enjoyed our discussion here at ESC, taking a little break from the, the science going on around us to talk about sudden cardiac death in athletes. That really does have implications for uh, broader societal uh, concepts. So thanks for joining us here on the heart.org and Medscape Cardiology from Amsterdam.